This program contains images of First Nations women who have died, including graphic content and offensive language that may disturb some viewers. We are not just numbers. Do you hear? We're not just numbers. We're humans. For too long, the nation has remained silent on a crisis. Indigenous women who are murdered and missing. I'm talking about a national silence when it comes to the murders of First Nations women. They are the forgotten women of Australia, murdered at up to 12 times the national average Aboriginal women are among the most victimised groups in the world. I see this issue of violence against Aboriginal women as one of the most serious human rights issues possibly facing our country today. Australia's national reckoning with family violence is taking hold. It was a crime that shook the nation and our national leaders. Mothers and children. Murder, it's what it is. It is just too horrible to contemplate. How does such evil happen on our land? Domestic violence is a stain on our nation and on our soul. But the stories of murdered and missing Aboriginal women have been neglected. Aboriginal people are not believed. They have to go to vastly different lengths to be believed. Canada calls it a genocide. The United States considers it an epidemic. But here in Australia, we're only just waking up to the crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women. Tonight on Four Corners, we bring you the stories of Indigenous women whose deaths have been overlooked for far too long. Their families are heartbroken and angry, and they're urging the nation to pay attention. In Bantua, Alice Springs, the Northern Territory is one of the most beautiful places on this planet and we are home to the world's longest, continuous living culture. That's all things to feel proud of. So it is right that it's a tourist destination because it is amazing. However, the Northern Territory has the highest rates of domestic family sexual violence in Australia and amongst the highest rates in the entire world. In the heart of the nation, there's a deep sadness that lies beneath the natural beauty of Central Australia. Aboriginal mothers are being killed in alarming numbers. In 2018, Ms Rabuncha left Alice Springs with her friends to go all the way to Canberra. This group of grandmothers had had enough. Stop domestic violence! We would be like on the north side. Rachel, this morning we're going to go there this afternoon. Are you going? You will? Yeah, I'm good. They wanted to send a message to the nation's leaders to stop women being murdered. Stand with us, people. We want to play our part in closing the gap. Ms Rabuncha had never been to Canberra and had never spoken in public. It was a brave stand to get Australia to notice her pain. 
We used to be just violence, fighting. And it's got to stop. No more violence. It's not only for me, it's for everyone. Stop the violence. The women from Central Australia placed flowers on the manicured grass inside Parliament House in memory of Indigenous women who'd been killed. Firstly, people need to understand just how brave, just how courageous, just how astounding uh, these women are. It is a total act of courage. The women staged an emotional sit down for their sorry business. Thank you so much for sharing. Less than three years later, Ms. Rabuncha, who'd fought against domestic violence, was murdered. Our sister, another one lost to us, a dearly, a passionate person. It's not just a number and we will not let her to be invisible. Her story matters. Her life matters. On the edge of Alice Springs, Ms Rabuncha lived in a tiny community called Undupper Camp with her family. Sarah Rabuncha is one of her daughters. Nancy Kibbe. Your grandmother, your grandmother. She was so excited and she came and said, oh, I went to Canberra, work in Parliament House, yeah. And she made us happy as well. So I was so proud of her when she went to Canberra, to Parliament House. So your mum, she wanted things to change, didn't she? Yeah, she was trying her best to change things, but yeah. Her niece Cecily called her mum. Uh, growing up calling her mum was like she was the person in front of me, you know? And, and she was just an amazing woman. Her house was filled with love, kindness, and amazing kids everywhere. She was just that type of person where she'd care for kids, you know, and we'd all sleep with her, even though there was no space to sleep in. Ms Rabuncha was the glue that held this big family together. Her home was a safe space for women who'd been assaulted. I just tell them to go to the women's safety group. They can help sort of violence Yeah, she took other ladies, like, away from violence, you know, and she used to help and call the cops for them when they get bashed, yeah. She'd always help, because a lot of women always run to her house and say, oh, I want to stay here for the night. Always took care of women and kids. While Ms Rabuncha was working to keep other women safe, she was guarding a painful secret from her friends. Her new partner, a man named Malcolm Abbott, had begun abusing her. It was unexpected. She really didn't know what was coming towards her. She knew he was a violent man, not good. But he was, she was trying to change him, but he didn't want that change. Dr Shay Brown was a close friend and worked with Ms Rabuncha for almost a decade. None of us knew 
that that was going on and that seems unimaginable now. Her children were worried. We had a really horrible feeling about it. At first, she looked happy. We was always intervened, but she'd always said, that's my business, you know. And we was like, no, he's not OK, you know. We don't want you to get hurt from him. So what kind of concerning behaviours would you see from him towards your mum? When they were drinking, it was, he was always getting angry and saying things, oh, I'm going to hurt you really bad, you know. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to hit you. On a hot summer's afternoon in January 2021, Ms Rabuncha leaves her beloved Andaba camp for the last time. She and Malcolm Abbott meet some relatives at a club in the afternoon. Early in the evening, Ms Rabuncha has a win at the pokies and Abbott wants the money. She refuses and he becomes more and more volatile. Malcolm Abbott is ordered to leave the club. On his way out, he tells Ms Rabuncha, I'll go get a gun and shoot you. It's at this point that Ms Rabuncha should have been safe. Malcolm Abbott's been asked to leave and she's inside the club when a security guard also kicks her out moments later, alleging she was drunk. As she leaves, she's heard to say, I feel scared. And Malcolm Abbott, is waiting for her outside. That was one opportunity, but there were lots of other opportunities as well. There were many opportunities, not just that night, but earlier. Sarah Rabuncha calls her mum multiple times, begging her to come home. I was calling her and talking to her, and the bloke was there at the like the bloke was back ran, talking and threatening her and yelling at her as well. She told me on the phone, oh, this bloke's gonna hit me. I don't want to let you know where I am. Cause this bloke's talking, thing, you know, talking wrong way to me and threatening me and trying to hit me. It's the last conversation they have. Sarah was trying to call, but at around 8.30, Wish the phone didn't no no answer. Just keep ringing and ringing and ringing. Message bank, message bank. Ms. Rabuncha is trapped in the car as Abbott drives around town abusing her. She escapes when they pull into a service station in the middle of town. It's across the road from the Alice Springs Hospital. She walked across the road and sat in front of the Alice Springs Hospital where there's a cul-de-sac. Malcolm Abbott then drove the car over and he circled the car park a number of times. She didn't get in the car. She was obviously removing herself from that situation and I believe she went to the hospital because she believed it would be safe. When we did safety mapping with women here, they said that the hospital was a safe place because of the security. So I think that's why she went there. Um, he continued to circle the car park, calling out to her. Ms Rabuncha tries to get up, but there's no time to run as Malcolm Abbott deliberately drives straight into her. He then accelerates and reverses over her multiple times, dragging her around the car park while she's stuck underneath the car. And he leaves her, bleeding to death, outside the emergency department. Doctors and nurses rush out to try to save her, but Ms Rabuncha is left with catastrophic injuries. A post-mortem reveals Ms Rabuncha's arms, legs and ribs were broken, she had head and spinal injuries and abrasions to 40% of her body. She dies of multiple blunt force injuries. He walked back over to his car and he drove home uh, to a family's house. The family asked what had happened to the car 
and he had said he'd just bumped the gate. Ms Rabunch's daughters drive straight to the hospital when they hear something terrible has happened. My mind just went blank and just thinking about her and my heart was just broken. And the doctor came and said, oh, no, she never make it. All the doctors, nurses came and comforted us, um, came and just said sorry to us, like shook our hands out of respect. As Ms Rabunch's friends waked to the news she'd been hit by a car, the full horror of what she'd endured starts to emerge. All deaths cause pain and all deaths cause impact. But when someone is murdered and they're just ripped so violently out of your life and they just leave this huge gaping wound, it is feels unsurvivable, insurmountable. Malcolm Abbott pleaded guilty to murder earlier this year. He was sentenced to 25 years in jail. It wasn't the first time. In 1996, he went on a stabbing spree, killing a woman and injuring two others. We seated at the back. Yeah, and then all that day was just hearing all the stories about him and the backgrounds. It was disgusting. To then hear about the pattern of violent behaviour, the many, many times before that, that Malcolm Abbott had severely injured a woman, stabbed women, punched women with sharp metallic objects, killed another woman. So the responsibility is his. He pled guilty, but there is systems failure here. How can a man repeatedly stab women, severely injure women, and receive sentences as short as 12 months. It doesn't make any sense. Something has gone wrong here. Abbott had spent almost half of his adult life in prison. In a previous case, a judge remarked that jail was not enough to deter his offending. We don't have the mechanisms at the moment available to effectively monitor the risk that men who are using violence pose to women and children. Um, we are still responding to domestic violence as though they're just one-off incidents. No one is, is looking at that full pattern and nobody is then managing that risk. Four Corners can reveal that police had been called 18 times over the course of their two-year relationship. Those reports included Ms Rabuncha telling police that Abbott had harassed her, punched her, kicked her and threatened to stab her. He was never charged. Mum had to lock the door and ring up the police and the police used to come and just take her, just, I mean, take him just to family member's place. Ms Rabunch's loved ones have spent the past two years questioning why her death wasn't a watershed moment for the nation. When is enough is enough? Especially for our Aboriginal women's voices to be heard. You know, we're just sick of it. After the flowers we put up at the hospital, and then we came back home, and that night I, I was trying to sleep. But then I had this dream, she, like she came. She told me to take care of everybody, look after, look after her son, her kids, and grandchildren and everyone in the family said so this doesn't happen to anybody in my family members. 
Yeah. There's no speeches in Parliament decrying and saying we need to end violence against First Nations women. There are no social media campaigns. There's just silence. So what else is there to conclude but they simply don't care and don't value the lives of First Nations women, not like they value the lives of other women. That is so enraging, it is crippling. We need national leadership and we need a response and we need it now. Officially, there's no data giving the total number of murdered and missing First Nations women. For the first time, Four Corners can reveal at least 315 Indigenous women have been killed or disappeared in the last two decades. This is who they are. The Indigenous women who've been killed amount to 23% of all female homicides. This is a national uh, crisis. It's a, a, such a serious human rights violation. We call it Indigenous femicide. It's been a taboo subject that nobody wants to face this, this uh, violence, extreme violence against particularly women and children. Each year, police and Aboriginal women's services are fielding thousands of calls from First Nations women in danger. The more remote you go, help is harder to find. We're about 15 hours from Alice Springs on the way to a small remote community called Amunbidji. There's a family here whose story is really heartbreaking and it's taken us a couple of weeks to get in touch with them, but we've heard that they want to tell their story. Yeah, we're just going to get up um, some ice and water. Okay. Is Jul Julianne here? Yeah, she is. Oh, good. Roberta Curry grew up in Amunbidji and surrounding remote communities about two hours east of Kununurra. With her high cheekbones and a love of fashion and travel, she had big dreams. She said that she wanted to be a model like uh, one day I'm a, like, when I want to be a model and I want to become like a millionaire, like to make money for my family. <laughs> Roberta often moved around, but she'd return home to the bush to see her older sisters. In this tiny community, family is everything. Check it out. Like how we are now with the kids cooking, feed in the fire and coals, making barbecue at Ripa down here, at bamboo. She would have been here if she would have been still alive with us, enjoying its life, young life. Maybe she would have been here with his three sons, but now they're not here. Mm. In 2017, Roberta returned home with her new partner, Lorenzo Deegan. Deegan was an extremely violent man. He'd previously been fined and convicted for punching and kicking Roberta until she lay unconscious. I thought it was a good, like, trying to make a good relationship together. And we didn't know that this could happen. Within months, he was in prison for bashing Roberta's neighbour in a jealous rage. The man was left with a traumatic brain injury. In 2019, 
Deegan was released and ordered not to contact the neighbour. There were no protections in place for Roberta. Lorenzo had previously assaulted her in such a horrific manner and he assaulted another victim, a white male victim. When he was released, when the perpetrator was released, nobody went to her and developed a safety plan with her. Deegan's parole conditions are to stay sober, wear a GPS tracker and attend rehab and domestic violence programs. Roberta had ended the relationship, but Deegan immediately starts to stalk her. Roberta, if you don't come to Catherine, I'm coming up there and I'm going to smash the fuck out of you, you motherfucker. Keep hanging around Darwin, you dog. You wait, Roberta, I'll be there. With Lorenzo, I thought she, he's going to move on with his life. But he was still tracking her down, like, asking where his friend. And even though Lorenzo was asking me, and I said to him, I don't know where he is. Like, I didn't want to tell him. After lying to his parole officer, he arrives in Darwin and kidnaps Roberta. On the drive to Catherine, he repeatedly punches her. She manages to escape and meets up with her sister. She's trying to get away from Lorenzo. She, she said this to me. I want to leave this man. I don't want to be with him. He's a violent man. It was here at the Catherine Centrelink office that Lorenzo finds Roberta. He screams at her while Roberta tries to hide behind a relative, but Lorenzo attacks Roberta, punching her several times in the face until she falls to the ground. He then kicks her while she's down and threatens to drop a block of concrete on her until someone intervenes. But none of these assaults were reported to police. She escapes again. Deegan tracks her down to a friend's place. This time, she does call police. The recording of what happened next was tendered to the Northern Territory Coroner's Inquest. Caller, where do you need police? Um, we just need a police. Um, where? My, where? My, pa my partner, he's not supposed to be drinking, yeah. he's on parole. Where are we sending police to? To Bernard. To where? Bernard Park. For Lorenzo Deegan. Ten minutes earlier, parole officers arrive at his house for a random breath test. But he isn't there and no further action is taken. He's got a um, brace on his leg. Uh huh. Brace. Yeah. And he's intoxicated. He's, he's been drinking right now. Can you guys track him? No, I can't. Constables Maverick Carver and Andrew Schweed arrive. Well, I said police. We're here because Roberta called for us. That's the whole thing I've been saying the whole time we're here. Can you guys go and look for Lorenzo Deegan? What he you done? Drinking? No. Yeah. Really? Lorenzo is drinking. And That's terrible. And you've done this to me. All that. Roberta tells them that Deegan has injured her. Can't see anything. Right. Okay. Alright, where did he go? You went that way. Come on, you guys should know where to track him. I've never heard of him before, to be honest. But Constable Carver later admitted in an internal police investigation tendered at the coronial inquest, he knew Deegan was under strict orders to stay sober. The report found neither officer followed their protocols by checking the police database. Had they done that, they would have become aware of Deegan's previous violence against Roberta. So where else does he live? They neglected all of their responsibility to look into who Lorenzo was and who she was. And uh, clearly those circumstances required um, immediate 
protective actions. There was nothing of that nature done for her. The officers searched for Deegan for 10 minutes before being called to another job. Less than an hour later, Roberta makes an urgent call for a second time. The police don't turn up, concluding no new incident had occurred. At 10.37pm, Roberta calls Triple O a final time. Um, he's coming around and talking. Where are you? He's drinking. He, he's intoxicated and he's threatening, he's threatening us. The ones are digging and they're all fighting out there. Seriously. Come on. Police return to the house. It's police again. Do you not listen? I've said this to you like five times. If you don't want us to come back, stop calling us. I'm not calling. Yeah, she is. If you're getting angry at us coming, stop calling. Easy as that. Right, yeah. I'm going to go now, OK? Stop calling. You obviously don't want us here. Roberta never calls again. She was calling for help and the police didn't help. She really was warned off and it was clear that she wasn't going to get any help from the police and she didn't have anyone else to turn to. The internal police report says the officers failed to properly investigate the assault or report the incident to Deegan's parole officers. Four days later, Deegan finds Roberta and takes her back to his house. In the early hours of the 18th of June 2019, Roberta was cowering in a bedroom in Deegan's home with nowhere to go. The final punch Deegan inflicted on her broke one of her ribs and lacerated her spleen. She died lying in agonising pain on the floor. She was 28 years old and a mother of three boys. I just felt like I couldn't even breathe. And I had to tell my sister, Renee. I felt really like, I feel like my heart gonna stop. Roberta's sister, Julianne, says she spent weeks pleading with other officers to investigate. They said, we can't do anything now because they told me that she's been drinking. That's how she got hurt. And I said, no. How did, he, how did she pass away? He's done something to her. I need to investigate what did happen to her. That's what I said to the police. Hey, Lorenzo. Hey, Lorenzo. Yeah. Under arrest for assault, OK? That's assaulting. What's that? Put these on you? Deegan was arrested three weeks later and eventually charged with murder. And that assault is for... Right, Lorenzo, I'm just going to do a quick search, buddy. The charge was downgraded to manslaughter. He'll be eligible for parole in three years. Because he, he got charged with manslaughter in the end, not murder. What do you think about that? I felt like it, it wasn't right. A year later, police completed the internal report into the actions of Constable Schweed and Constable Carver on the night they were called out. The conclusions are scathing. The report says both officers were informed their conduct towards Roberta was negligent, inefficient and careless, and subsequent police actions may have led to sufficient evidence to prosecute Mr Deegan and may have prevented Ms Curry's death from occurring. I was shocked. I felt angry, like they didn't do the right thing. If we got, if we would get arrested, that wouldn't like happen. She would be still here with us right now. 
The police officers asserted in their responses that Roberta could be unreliable in her account of the version of events and she had made false allegations previously. The officers did admit failings and expressed a deep sense of regret. The pair only received a formal written caution and are still serving in the force. The system was, um, it, it, was it was completely failing her. Uh, we do need to look closely at her death and the deaths of each and every Aboriginal woman uh, through a, a proper review process and start to reveal uh, the, the true circumstances of, of their death. Noongar academic Dr Hannah McGlade is a member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. She's seen the same pattern across multiple deaths of Indigenous women. It seems that every step of the justice system, there's a failure that then increasingly leads to her vulnerability to the murder. And that is commonly what transpires in, re in relation to Aboriginal women. When it comes to Aboriginal women being victims, there's under-policing. I'm still grieving right now. In Australia, nobody knows how many black women are missing. There is no official data. Their bodies have never been found. Their families may never know what happened to them. It has been hard to understand the full scale of the crisis, but we know that it is a crisis because of the lived experiences of Aboriginal people and their testimonies. The absences of Aboriginal women who are still felt all across this country, who are never forgotten, who are always mourned and grieved. At the bottom of a cliff in a wealthy suburb in Brisbane, a shocking discovery. A woman's body, discarded in a sports bag, is hidden in plain sight. Her dismembered remains have been here for months. Her bra still intact around her torso and shoulder bones. I actually got pulled out of school. Um, and was told, and then it was all over the news, so... Yep, I remember. Only the news, what we saw on the news, was the information we had. Yeah, I started crying, went, went quiet for a couple months. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. Yeah. Her name was Constance May Watcho, a mother of 10. Oh, God. <laughs> she could be funny, straightforward, very loving, very loving towards her children and her brothers, you know, towards her siblings and her extended family. She wouldn't beat around the bush, like, um, yeah, strong willed, strong mind, um, and very nurturing, like, with her kids. She will always be happy even through sorry business and yeah she'll always check and see us what we're doing i'm not just grieving for myself i'm grieving for my younger siblings because they don't have an opportunity to get to know our mum and they never will so my heart hurts from for them her family had been searching for constance for 10 months her sister-in-law, Tarita Fisher, was worried when no one had heard from Constance in weeks. And I got really concerned because it's unlike Connie or Constance um, not to be known around. So I said to one of the brothers at the time, I said, look, this is unusual, like, she needs to be listened as listed as missing persons, like this isn't normal. Her family reported her missing in February 2018, 
Two days later, police assessed the case as medium risk. So like, no, she was a medium risk. That's their terminology. When an Aboriginal woman goes missing in our communities, it's high risk. It, it's, but we don't use that language, you know? When someone goes missing, there's something seriously wrong. Did they come and ask us about what kind of risk that she's in? No. And we would have told them, it's serious business, this. It's serious business. You've got a family here coming saying, we are deeply worried. Why wouldn't it have been taken seriously? You want my honest truth? Yeah, I do. Because she's a black woman. It's a black woman gone missing. Disappeared off the face of the earth and no one could locate her. Family couldn't locate her. They didn't care. They didn't care. Last month, Constance's family arrived at a coronial inquest wanting to know what happened to their mother. My mind was racing, so... Just a lot of mixed emotions, anger. It's good that um, it's been brought um, to light. Um, hearing the details and stuff like that is really traumatising, but overall, I had to be there because we need justice. It was like, made me angry, made me sad at times, just hearing things you don't want to hear. The inquest heard that Constance had argued with her boyfriend, Sam Sobjack, the night she was last seen alive. Multiple witnesses told the coroner Mr Sobjack was seen the next day with black eyes and scratch marks to his face and neck. Mr Sobjack told the inquest he couldn't remember the last time he saw Constance or whether they'd argued. We had heard evidence from witnesses who had seen Constance and Sam that Sam had been violent towards her and it did come out that there was violence in the relationship. It was six weeks after Constance was reported missing before police conducted any formal interviews. Constance. Aboriginal journalist and academic Amy McGuire has been closely following the inquest. Constance's case is absolutely shocking because at every level in the, in the investigation she was failed. At the missing persons investigation, they largely didn't search for her. Queensland police told the inquest they invested significant resources into the investigation, including checking interstate police databases and accessing bank records. Constance Watcho had had a difficult life. She'd spent time in prison and had been battling drug addiction for some years. Constance was a criminalised woman. She was known to police and so that when she was a wanted person, she was highly visible to them as police. She had just gotten out of prison just a few days before she disappeared. But when she is missing, she is seen as unworthy of searching for. Police couldn't determine the cause of death, so Constance's death is being treated as suspicious. I do see a lot of things on the news. White women going missing, getting found, um, proper investigation into what happened, and it hasn't, it's not like that with my mother, so I think that is a big factor into this. Constance's body was discovered just 200 metres from where she'd been living with Mr Sobjack and two other men. One of them reported the discovery of her remains in the bag to police. The other man, Dallas Bandman, told the coroner he gave that bag that Constance's remains were found in to Mr Sobjack when he kicked the pair out of the house on the night she was last seen. Police told the inquest all three men have been named as persons of interest. They all deny having anything to do with Constance's death. 
Mr Sobjack will return to give evidence when the inquest resumes. No one's giving us answers. Sick of it. Treating blackfellas like we're nothing. We are. We're something. I'm wild. I'm angry. I'm crying for my children and her brothers, her family. We want answers now. We can't live without knowing what happened to her. Dinanja, what am I, Dinanja? Ka, Turbo Jagan, Barada Bana, Kawaka, Batila. As a mark of respect, last month Constance's family held a ceremony in her honour at the site where she was found. <laughs> Aboriginal families all across Australia are mourning missing and murdered mothers. And they want action. This is in remembrance of a sister, a mother, not forgotten. She should be here with us today, but no, she's not here with us. She's born. I miss her so much. And nowadays, my little nephew always. You know, ask me, oh, when are not going to come back? And I told him, no, 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 not going to come back to you. We love her, we miss her, and we're not going to stop. We're going to keep fighting for justice. If this program has raised concerns for you, you can contact one of these services.